Thank you, Maxie. I, I come to these lectures just to hear him introduce somebody. <laughs> he, he just keeps out doing himself. I, I tell you, that, that's great. I, he always says he's been a friend for all of these many years, and the thing about it is it's true. I know uh, he has lots of friends, and they are really his, his friends. It's so good to be back here at Brown Trail. My relationship to the congregation goes back to the, uh, I think sometime in the 60s. It was when the congregation was quite uh, new, at least I thought it was at that time, and been in and out of here at different times, and it's so good to be back. Uh, the School of Preaching uh, has had a dynamic impact upon the brotherhood and around the world. Uh, one of the students of the School of Preaching is uh, the uh, son-in-law of one of my dearest friends that was, we share first names, his is James Delta and mine's Delta James, and uh, we uh, grew up a quarter of a mile from each other in, in uh, Woodward, Oklahoma, or out in the country in Woodward, Oklahoma, and so we have lots of, of deep roots there. Uh, I recommended to Maxie, a student that we did, you didn't get, I'm sorry to say, uh, not long ago, and just this last Sunday night, there was a, a brother that has made application for the school here that I was visiting with. It's, it's just mighty good to be here. Those that are involved in the School of Preaching are doing a great job also. Uh, I was real pleased uh, to receive this assignment. Usually, my material is more pol uh, polemic. Uh, I have lectured most of the time and recently on the role of women, the change, uh, changing in the church, silence of the scripture, hermeneutics, uh, the nature of the church, uh, glossolalia and koinonia and, and all of those things that uh, I've written about. Uh, and it's so good to be able to speak on the called out of Christ because it deals with the here and now and it deals with us instead of them. Because how we view ourselves as the, the called out of Christ determines a whole lot of what we do and what we believe. Uh, I don't know how to say this. Uh, I guess I will say, I'm not a traditional preacher. You saw that. Uh, I have notes up here. I have manuscript up here. Uh, uh, I'm not a traditional preacher. In fact, tradition is... Uh, is something that is far removed from me. I remember in that little rural one-room uh, church building north of Woodward, Oklahoma, when we uh, came to those passages of Scripture that dealt with tradition, there was always a change in the sound of our voice. It was the traditions of men. And we went over the passage, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men and not after Christ. And you have made void the commandments of God by your traditions. And so I thought it was the thing to do is to be radical, not to be encumbered by any of the things that have gone on with those that have gone before us. In fact, one of the favorite stories 50 years ago at that little rural congregation was about how that uh, with this old tradition of three songs and a prayer. And the tragic thing about it, it has become a tradition. People are still using that old traditional illustration. <laughs> if there's anything that's tradition, I guess it is that. But then I learned that tradition is something that's real good. In 2 Thessalonians 2.15, So then, brethren, stand firm and hold fast to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. The word tradition is paradosis. It's a neutral word. It can be traditions of men and be bad, or it can be traditions, apostolic traditions, and good. And here he says, hold fast the traditions that you have taught, whether by word or by letter. In the next chapter, in verse three, 6, it says, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep aloof from every brother that leads an unruly life and not according to the tradition that you receive from us. Apostolic tradition is binding. It is that which has... There are technical words that are used for it. 
It is received and delivered. As I receive from the Lord, I deliver unto you. Contend earnestly for the faith that was once for all delivered unto the saints. As And uh, in all of these passages where that is used, it is a technical phrase to say, this is what we got from the apostles and this is what we deliver unto you. This is what we got from the Lord and this is what we deliver unto you. So I am, I guess, a traditional preacher. Traditions are bad if they're from men. They're good if they're from God. We're in the stance of changing traditions. And in these changing traditions, we shouldn't, we shouldn't rebel. We should just see which direction they're going. Anything that is changed toward the Word of God is restoration. Anything that is changed away from the word of God is apostasy. Change is not wrong. Repentance is change. Restor restoration is change. But what are we changing from and what are we changing to? And this is the reason that I am real pleased to deal with. Open your Bibles, if you will, to First Peter, the second chapter, verse 9 and following. Members of the church of Christ are special people because they are the called out of Christ. They are not special because of who we are, but whose we are. We find our identity and our glory in the one that has called us. Our existence, our ideals, and our conduct are all wrapped up, on, up in who Jesus is and what he taught. This passage of scripture was written to those that had been persecuted and driven from their homelands in Asia. They were scattered abroad. And the apostle tells them who they are and told, tells them how they got to, to be who they are and tells them how who they are determines the conduct of their life. Notice in verse 9, it says that who we are. We are aliens and strangers and we find our identity and our relationship with God. We are in verse 9, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. Notice, we are, because of who we are, it sets us off distinctively apart from the rest of the world. And as who we are, we are to do something that you may pro proclaim the excellency of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And then he tells us why we are who we are in verse 10. For you once were not a people, but now are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you receive mercy. This is, of course, from Hosea. And he says, uh, this is where we get our identity, not because of what we have done or who we are, but because we have been chosen of God. And then he tells us in verse 11, how we are to act. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lust. Verse 12, keep your behavior excellent among the Gentile. Verse 13, submit yourselves. And then he goes on down to submit yourselves unto your masters. In verse 18, to submit yourselves unto wives to their husbands on down in chapter 3. He said, submission to governors, submission unto slaves, to masters, submission of wives unto the husbands is the, is the, uh, the context of this text. Now, because of this, there are certain things that we are to look at as the called out of Christ. Verse 9 and 10 identifies those that are called out of Christ. They are the chosen race, the royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of God's own possession. And then the rest of the chat verses tell us how we are to act. They are to abstain from fleshly lust which war against the soul. Let's look at some of these terms. First, let's look in the chosen race. Now, in the immediate context, there are those people that have been scattered throughout Bithynia and Cappadocia and in Asia. And he says that you are called out. And he says this, and then he uses some Old Testament concepts and Old Testament terms. The chosen people, that's who we are. Like Israel of old, who were the chosen people in the Old Testament, we are also special to God. 
Not because we are so powerful or good and great, but because of his grace. A passage in Deuteronomy 10, verse 14 and following, the apostle, or the, uh, Moses write, Behold, the Lord your God belongs to heaven and the highest heavens and the earth and all that is in it. He says, He is the great and good and powerful God. He says, Yet on your fathers did the Lord set his affections to love them and to choose their descendants after them, even you above all people. Don't you know that that that, that just showed them who they were. He says, the great God of gods, the one that spoke the universe into existence, the one that is, is all-powerful and all-knowing, he chose you. It was not Israel's merit that identified them as God's people. It was the sovereignty choice of God. In the similar way, we are God's chosen race, not because of our merit, but because we have been chosen of God. We are feel, we have been received by His grace. Paul expresses that so beautifully in Romans the fifth chapter, six, eight, and ten, when he says, When we were yet helpless, the right time Christ died for the ungodly. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were enemies, we were reconciled unto God. We, as God's called out, are chosen a race. We are a, a special people, not by merit, but by grace. The other term is royal priesthood. Our identity as the called out of Christ involves both the royalty of kingship and the holiness of priesthood. We are a royal priesthood. We're children of God, and that gives us identity. We've all been baptized into Christ, been born of the water and of the Spirit into the kingdom of God in John 3. We have been those that are, we're all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. As God's children, we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Uh, sometimes we hear people in sort of a, a, a way that is sometimes a, a little brassy, but yet it conveys a concept, king's kids. We are God's children. We are the sons and daughters of the king of kings and the Lord of lords, and that makes us special. We are a royal priesthood. And we don't have to have a priest to offer a sacrifice in the temple in order to join in fellowship with God. We can go to God directly through his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus is our high priest who has been tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. And therefore, we can boldly come unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. As the children of the King of Kings and as a priest of God with Jesus as our high priest, we are special people. He has made us a kingdom priest of his God and father, uh, in, of his father in Revelation 1 and 6. But also we are a holy nation. Just as the nation of Israel was holy, set apart for a whole, holy purpose, a specific purpose, a non, not profane, we as God's people are also holy. The church is called the holy temple in Ephesians 2 and 21. And in writing to those that would divide the church of the Lord in Corinth, he said in 1 Corinthians 3 and 16, But ye are the temple of God, and the Holy uh, Spirit of God dwells within you. If any man destroy the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, and such are you. In the context of that are those that would divide the body of Jesus Christ. And if there is anything that is distasteful unto God and will cause the judgment of God to come upon us, it is to divide his people. He says, you are holy because the Spirit of God dwells within you. And if any man destroy the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy and such are you. Peter describes Christians as a holy people in 1 Peter 1, 15 and following. You, are, uh, you shall be holy for your, just as I am holy, he quotes from the Old Testament. We must not, we cannot be defiled by immorality or by secularism. We are to constantly present our bodies as holy sacrifices unto God. We are a people for God's own possession. Our bodies are holy, and that is that which is the greatest argument of 1 Corinthians 6 against immorality. 
Christians are distinct, different, holy, royal, priestly, chosen. Isn't it great to be a Christian? Oh, isn't it great to be a Christian? In the King James Version, it has here, instead of a, a people of God's own possession, it has a peculiar people. It's not a very good translation in the, from the original, but it really conveys the meaning of the context. We are a peculiar, set-apart, holy people. We are called from what to what? Look in verse 9. That you may proclaim the excellency of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. In Colossians 1.13 we have similar language. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son. We no longer grope in the darkness of despair and loneliness. We have been transferred into the marvelous light of the kingdom of the Son of God. We are children of light. We have been dispelled from the darkness of spiritual ignorance and because we have received the light of the gospel. The darkness of evil men and evil institutions have been shattered by the radiance of him who is the light of the world. And the light, darkness of error has been exposed by the inspired scripture described as a lamp in a dark place. We have been called for a purpose. To proclaim the excellency of him who has called us out of darkness. We have been called to call others. One of my favorite songs is, and it speaks so immediate to where we are. He says, if the name of the Savior is precious to you and his care has been constant and tender and true, if the light of his presence has brightened your way, oh, will you not tell it today? Oh, will you not tell it today? Because of who we are, we share the faith that we have with the world. We're to proclaim the excellency of Christ with thanksgiving for what he has done. We are saved to save. We have been blessed to bless. We have been called to call. I like the song that the university students used to sing. He is my everything. He is my all. He is my everything, both great and small. He gave his life for me, made everything new. He is my everything. Now, how about you? Look at the text in verse 10. There is a contrast of who we, who we were to who we are. It is the language of prophet Hosea. You remember the background. Uh, at the time that Hosea prophesied, Israel had played the harlot with other gods, and God told him to take a wife of holotry, and she bore him two daughters. The first daughter's name meant she has not obtained compassion. The second daughter's name meant that she is not my people. Or The names of these daughters reflected uh, God's rejection of Israel because of their sins. Later, in a prophetic way, Hosea writes, I will have compassion on her who had not obtained compassion. And I will say unto those that are not my people, you are my people. And they will say, thou art my God. There is a prediction of restoration. Just as we, and this is the reason that it is used here. He says, look who you were and look who you are. Look who you were and look you where you are. You did not have compassion. Now you do. You were not my people. Now you are. Not because of anything that we have done, but because of the majesty, grace of God. Christians in time of persecution, rejection, and alienation in the culture needs this kind of affirmation. We are a, a chosen re race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of God's own possession. We remember who we were, and by the grace of God, who we have become, the called out of God. Notice the contrast. Not my people to become the people of God. Paul uses this concept to the Gentile Christians in Ephesus, and it, was de and it so aptly describes Christians today. Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, 
But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Praise the Lord. We have, who were not a people now have become a people of God. We who had not obtained mercy now have obtained mercies. On in the, the same passage in Ephesians 2, he says in verse 4 and 5, But God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, has made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. The called out of Christ are those that have been saved. The word ecclesia is not in the passage. But the word ek, the preposition ek, and the verb kaleo is, they're called out. Those alien, Christ, uh, alien uh, Christians in Asia were called out people of God, the ecclesia. They were called out of God from the world into his kingdom. Now, there's some question about the translation of ecclesia. The definition in the lexicon, lexicon is a gathering of citizens called out from their homes into a public place and an assembly, and it is so used in Acts 19, 30, 39. In the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament, it term is often used with reference to the assembly of Israel. But in the New Testament, the term usually refers to the church. It is the church that is the assembled body of Christians in 1 Corinthians 14, 23. It is the church at a certain locality in 1 Thessalonians 1 and 1 and 1 Corinthians 1 and 2 to the church, of, uh, church at Corinth, church at the, of the Thessalonians. It is used in a more generic way of the church universally for all time. Upon this rock I will build my church. The term ecclesia is used in a secular assembly, but the most common use is the New Testament. We have been called out of the world into the kingdom of God. Uh, out of, uh, we have been delivered from the domain of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of his dear son in Colossians 1 and 12. Uh, you have been called out of darkness into his marvelous light in the text that we just read. We've been called by God into his own kingdom and glory, 1 Thessalonians 2 and 12. We have been called through the gospel that we may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, 2 Thessalonians 2 and 14. And that gospel is a traditional thing. It has been, as he had received, he delivered it, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 4. We have been called into the fellowship of God's Son, Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 1 and 9, referring to baptism. It is called to be saints in 1, Corinthians, 1 Peter 1 and 15. We are called into one body, Colossians 3 and 15. We are the called out of God. We're special, special people. But we are called out to act also. And actually, this is the basics of the message. He says, look again in the text in verse 11. I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lust which war against the soul. We are strangers and aliens. We're to keep apart from the world and we are to submit we're not of the world. The tug of the culture is constantly upon us, and it's hard to be different in a secular society. There is pressure to conform. The door of compromise seems always open. We understand this process from history. Compromise, compromise, compromise are the steps by which the church has gone into apostasy time and time again. First, there is a resistance from cultural conformity. Second, there is a toleration with the culture. Third, there is the espousing of the culture. And then finally, there is a defending of the cultural things. Leonard Allen, in his book, The Worldly Church, though I disagree vehemently with his use of the church in a, uh, as sort of a denominational way, yet he really touched a good chord when he spoke of the worldly church or the secular church. The church has become secular in our time. Uh, we are to be as aliens in a strange land, constantly on guard against those that would absorb us in the culture. 
the warnings given to Christians about the danger of becoming too much at home in the world. We sang the song a moment ago, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. We need to believe that. Because we must not let the world become a part of us or to become a part of the world. In John chapter 17, Jesus uh, said of his disciples, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And in Romans 12, in verse 2, he says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In 1 John 2 and 15, he says, do not love the world, nor the things that are in the world, for all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the vainglory of life. We are different. Our teachings is different. Our lifestyle is different. Our goals are different. It is ridiculous to compromise doctrine to win converts. It is preposterous to change our practices to please people. It is shameful to lower our moral and ethical standards to win the favor of men. We are aliens. We are strangers. Our citizenship is in heaven. This world is not our home. We are to abstain from fleshly lust. Since we are different, we should live differently. There is no way to show the world we are different except by the kind of lives that we live. In 1 Peter 1, it says, Do not be conformed to the former lust with which, uh, with, uh, which were yours in, in ignorance, but like the one who called you is holy, be holy yourself in all of your behavior. We're called out to be holy. So what? If people don't understand and refuse to, when we refuse to participate in some of their activity. So what if they ridicule us by being out of touch with the culture and naive and contemporary presupposition? So what? Because we are God's people. An alien is different and he believes that's good because his citizenship is in heaven. In 1 Peter 4, verse 2, it says, Live the rest of your time in the flesh, no longer to the lust of men, but for the will of God, for the time past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desires of the Gentiles. And in all of this, they are surprised that you do not run with them to the same excess of dissipation and they malign you. He says, the people that you work with day by day should see a difference. And yet, difference should be seen as Jesus Christ. We need to pray for the day when it will be reported by the media that those that have been called out by Jesus Christ, the church of Christ, do not abort their babies or san or do, and do not sanction immorality and fornication, adultery and homosexual conduct or drink alcohol or use drugs or defraud or lie and are not ashamed to stand up and to say so. I pray for the day that our brotherhood and preacher stories will be true and gossip about brethren are not, is not tolerated and arrogance is unknown among church leaders and gospel papers refuse to print rumors and slander. This kind of conduct is as much as fleshly lust as homosexual conduct. We need to pray for the day when the church is not uh, identified as a denomination of men and we do not act like denominations, but recognize the church for who she is. She is the plan one planned of God before the foundation of the earth, purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross, and indwelt by the Holy Spirit of promise. And because of that, we are different and should not be ashamed of it. We've been called out. The last part of the text says that we are to submit for the Lord's sake. One of the most distinctive qualities of those that are called out of Christ is their willingness to submit. Notice it says, for the Lord's sake, because Jesus wants me to. Jesus taught and practiced submission. The Sermon on the Mount said, turn the other cheek, go the second mile. The temptation of the devil Jesus submitted to Scripture and he said, It is written, it is written, it is written. In the agony of the garden thrice he prayed the prayer, Not my will, but thy will be done. The apostle in Philippians, the second chapter, speaks of this attitude of Christ. And he says that we're to have the same attitude. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, uh, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, 
But he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likenesses of a man and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient unto death, yea, the death of the cross. The called out of Christ are to submit to the will of God is revealed in the scripture. As the text says, we are obey the laws of the land. We pay our taxes. We accept our responsibilities uh, that are placed upon us in social structure and family structure. We are the called out of Christ. The church of Jesus Christ. We do not cheat on our income tax. We do not break traffic laws. Do not litter the highway. Do not trespass on the property of others. We are not a part of those who practice civil disobedience and violent lawlessness to get our way. We know that we will be abused. We know that we will be misunderstood. But we are content to be aliens and strangers. The Church of Christ in 1994 needs to learn again what it means to be the called out of Christ. If Jesus called us, we are to be holy as he is holy. Like the one who called you is holy, be holy yourselves in all of your behavior. We are to abstain from fleshly lust and keep our conversation excellent among the Gentiles. We are, we, we can apostize and lose our identity as quickly by compromising a holy lifestyle as we can by compromising sound doctrine. Christians should be easy to get along with. We should seek the good of others before ourselves. We should go the second mile. Let us never forget who we are. Oh, we are a chosen race. We are a royal priesthood. We're a people of God's own possession. We have been called out. We're aliens and strangers. We're not at home in this world. And we don't mix any more than oil mixes with water. We are the church of Christ, planned by God, purchased by Jesus, and indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Let us never forget who we are. Jesus Christ is our leader. He's shown us the way. We're to be in the world, but not of the world. And as Paul says in Philippians 3 and 20, our citizenship is in heaven.